Good morning and welcome to Sunday School. I'm glad that you're tuning in this morning. Uh, we are going to be finishing the book of 2 Thessalonians today. So we're going to be finishing out the quarter <clears throat> and next week uh, we'll be diving into 1st and 2nd Kings. Uh, but we'll leave that until then. So today, finishing up the book of 2nd Thessalonians, we've heard a lot from Paul. Um, in fact, in this letter specifically, we've heard that, that Paul was thankful to God, that the believers were persevering in their faith. Um, he was speaking to them, trying to correct some false understanding, uh, some false uh, prophets who were coming and saying that the, the Lord had already returned. And so he, he called them to stand firm on the truth, uh, not being deceived. He wanted them to pray. Uh, Paul was praying for them, and, and now Paul has also asked for prayer. And, and that leads us to the lesson we're going to be studying today. We're going to be looking at Paul's final instructions concerning living in obedience, living in obedience. And so he began uh, this lesson, what we're going to be looking at. He, he starts by establishing some standards. He set up some standards, some expectations for them to live by. He called out those who were idle. We're going to go into more detail about that, but he called them out, called them to provide for themselves. <clears throat> and then finally, uh, we see that he talked about church discipline. Um, how, how do you deal with someone who is not willing to listen to the commands uh, of Scripture? And so uh, while we're not going to look at the final three verses of this book, um, verses 16 through 18 in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Uh, it is helpful for us to understand it and remember it as we dive into this passage. And so those three verses, it looks at Paul's final statements. It's Paul's final statements about um, peace, God's peace specifically. He's praying for peace in their midst. And also it's, it's a, a very clear picture of God's grace. And so Paul is demonstrating his pastoral heart for the church. It's a, it's a desire for peace and grace. And so that should inform what we're going to study right now. And so as you're turning to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, now I want to start off with a, a couple of quick questions. Uh, the first question is this, what is the hardest job you've done that you enjoyed doing? What is the hardest job you've done that you have enjoyed doing? Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, there's a lot of jobs that are hard, and it's just not fun to do it. And so you just get through it. Uh, but sometimes there are jobs that are hard, but you still enjoy working and doing the work. And so whatever came to mind, whatever job came to mind, I guess the reason I want to bring this question up is because uh, I want to ask, why is hard work a good thing? Hard work in and of itself is not bad. Uh, and, and so, in fact, it's, it's a good thing. So why is that? <clears throat> um, and so I think it boils down to a couple things. Maybe you, you're thinking of something else, but a good work ethic values the importance of work and demonstrates diligence. When someone has a good work ethic, working hard, it demonstrates their values, it demonstrates their desire to, to fulfill their obligations and other things like that, and it demonstrates their diligence. Working hard also develops character. Uh, it strengthens one's abilities and one's um, perseverance. Um, and so we see it's a, it's a good character growth. Um, and so specifically for Christians, working while we're waiting for Jesus Christ to return, understanding the context of Paul writing, um, it's, it's instructed, it's commanded, it's expected, and it's good. Christians are to demonstrate a good work ethic. And so as we study this, uh, Paul, this passage, Paul is going to talk a little bit about that. Um, he's calling out the idol. He's establishing standards. He lived out what it meant to have a good work ethic. And, and so we're going to look at this passage. So 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 6 through 9. Let's read those verses. Now we command you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to keep away from every brother or sister who is idle and does not live according to the tradition received from us. For you yourselves know how you should imitate us. We were not idle among you. We did not eat anyone's food free of charge. Instead, we labored and toiled, working night and day, so that we would not be a burden to any of you. It is not that we don't have the right to support, but we did it to make ourselves an example 
to you so that you would imitate us. Paul begins this, uh, these verses and the, this section uh, by talking about a command. He says, now we command you. Uh, he didn't want there to be any confusion as to the importance of what he was about to say. It, it was of utmost importance. It's a, it wasn't an option, it was a command. And so to, to emphasize this further, we see that he says, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we command you, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. He, he's talking about what it means to be a follower of Christ. That's what Paul talks about. He shares the gospel. He talks about coming to know Christ. And he encourages and, and challenges and equips believers to live their life worthy of the gospel of Christ. And so what Paul's saying here is it's not an option. And it's coming from the authority of God. It's not coming from my opinions, my thoughts. This is what it means to be a follower of Christ. So we command you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And what does he command? He says, keep away from every brother or sister who is idle and does not live according to the traditions received from us. Who is idle. The word idle there can refer to pretty much anything that's kind of disorder. Disorderly behavior, uh, a failure to meet one's obligations, um, and so just not doing what is expected. Um, and so Paul, a um, little bit later on, he, he, he focuses on the failure uh, or refusal to work. Uh, essentially, he's saying um, people who have the ability, a little bit later on we see this, but here specifically, he's basically saying if you're idle, if you're not doing what's necessary, if you're not doing what's expected, if you're, if you're sitting around being lazy, idle, you are living contrary to the teaching of, of God's Word, uh, what it looks like to be a follower of Christ. And, and so what he's saying here is that the response to idleness needs to be swift and to send a clear message. Um, so he's saying they, they essentially needed to shun or, or keep away from the person. Um, and Paul said this uh, in another passage in 1 Corinthians 5. He talked about it. Uh, but there it was, it was more severe. Um, here we're going to see Paul's desires for restoration. Uh, and, and the same in 1 Corinthians. But, but um, basically Paul is saying this. Avoid someone who is idle, who's not doing what is expected. Uh, and so here's a question to help us think about this. Why do you think it was so important for them to keep away? Why would Paul say that? Shouldn't they show love? Shouldn't they show forgiveness? Shouldn't they show kindness? Shouldn't they show mercy? Might be some questions that come to mind. Yet Paul was very clear it was important for them to keep away. So why would it be so important to keep away, to avoid someone who was idle. Uh, uh, saying this another way, asking another way, what is the danger of associating with those who are idle? And really, uh, it boils down to two main things. Um, first of all, it hurts the church's witnesses, uh, excuse me, witness in the community. Uh, if there are people who are lazy, who are idle, who are not living, who are not providing for themselves, we're going to see that a little bit later in this passage. If, if we see people who are just taking advantage of, of other people and, and they have the ability to work, but they're not willing to work, what is that going to do? It's going to cast a... a, a this, this bad taste in the, in the eyes of the world. Um, we're not living our life to please the world, but we're living our life to honor God. And he calls us to a, a diligent life, a life of, of um, effectiveness and not one of laziness. And so it hurts our witness to the community. But most importantly, what Paul is trying to say is, if you allow those individuals, the people who are idle, if you just like overlook it, um, one of the things that's really dangerous is that bad company corrupts good morals. This is, comes from 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33. It says, do not be deceived. Good, excuse me, bad company corrupts good morals. Um, Paul is very concerned for the witness and the effectiveness of the church, their ability to stand firm on God's word. And so he's calling them out and he's saying, there needs to be some standards and here's some bad examples. You do not need to be hanging out with those people. You need to be following and Im imitating the good examples. And that's what he transitions to. <clears throat> so he talks about those who are idle, but then he transitions in verse 7 
to demonstrate some good examples. Um, Paul, he's not saying uh, he's preaching. He's preaching. He's doing what he's preaching. His, his, what he says is what he's doing in his life. And so, verse seven says, "For you yourselves know how you should imitate us. We were not idle among you. We did not eat anyone's food free of charge." Instead, we labored and toiled, working night and day, so that we would not be a burden on any of you. Um, we're going to read verse 9 again, look at that in just a second, but 7 and 8 is very clear. Paul is, um, he's not just telling him th- them what he wants them to do. Uh, no one could accuse Paul of idleness. He was living out what he preached. Uh, Paul, Timothy, Silas, they were living their life as an example for other believers to follow um, because they worked hard. The word labor and toil um, kind of describes this idea of a burdensome activity, hard label, labor. They, they had to work at it. It wasn't easy. Paul's not saying uh, everybody's doing it because it's easy. He's saying it's hard work, but they did it. And the purpose of them doing it, if you look back at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 5 through 10, you're going to see that Paul's desire was so that it wouldn't be a burden on them, but mainly so that the gospel could be proclaimed, that there would be no barriers between the gospel and the people. And so Paul had already mentioned this in 1 Thessalonians, and he's mentioning it again here, and he's demonstrating the example. He's setting the standard for Christian living, uh, one of effectiveness, one of hard work, one of of, um, pursuing excellence. And so he desired to not be a burden, and then we see he's, he wanted to make himself an example. Uh, one thing that's important, if you notice, um, so verse 9 says, it's, it is not that we don't have the right to support. The word uh, that he's talking about there, the right to support, uh, is talking really about the authority. He is being sent as an ambassador for Christ. He's, he's an apostle of Christ. And he's saying, I could have asked, but I didn't. Well, why didn't he? He did it to make an example, to make ourselves an example to you so that you would imitate us. His desire was that he could live out his faith and others would see it, excuse me, others would see it and follow and imitate him. Uh, And I think that's very clear from other passages. Paul constantly talks about imitating me as I imitate Christ. So think about this. Think about the various believers in your life, the people who you respect and you admire, and you see that they're pursuing God. What characteristics, what behaviors do they display? What are some things that they do that, hey, we need to imitate? Because Paul was setting a standard with his life. He was preaching the gospel, he was living the gospel, and he was calling others to do the same. (coughs) So those around you, what activities, what behaviors, what characteristics do they have? I wrote down a couple of them uh, that I thought of. Uh, Humility, commitment, faithfulness, dependence on God. Um, The the life of a believer. Paul is saying uh, we need to imitate those who are following Christ. He, He said, we set an example, you need to follow that. And so these first couple verses are just that. Setting an expectation, establishing standards for what it looks like to live. Um, And so now, in verses 10 through 12, Paul transitions a little bit, and he calls out uh, those who are idle. He commands them to do something. And so that's what we're going to dive into. But but real quick, I want to read two verses um, from 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. It says, Although we could have been a burden as Christ's apostles, instead we were gentle among you, as a nurse nurtures her own children. Then, verse 11 says, As you know, like a father with his own children, we encouraged, comforted, and implored each one of you to walk worthy of God. Uh, The reason I read those is because uh, notice how Paul viewed the believers in Thessalonica as his children. He was like their father or mother. He he felt a a desire, a burden to care for them and to uh, be be able to, to, to support them and help them. And so with this in mind, what would you have said <clears throat> or maybe I guess I should say, what have you said to your children when they are being idle or being lazy, not doing what is expected? What would you say? What have you said? Uh, something probably came to mind. You probably also thought about what your parents said to you. Um, you know, you need to, you need to work hard. Uh, don't quit. Stop being lazy. Take out the trash. Don't watch the TV. Uh, there's a lot of things that come to mind. Um, but 
whatever the case is, our desire should be and, and probably was to help our children understand the importance of hard work. But what did Paul say? So he's talking about these individuals in the church who are being idle. And so he's treating them as his family, his, his children. He's, he's wanting to uh, encourage them and challenge them to grow. So what does he say here in verses 10 through 12? In fact, when we were with you, this is what we commanded you. If anyone isn't willing to work, he should not eat. For we hear that there are some among you who are idle. They are not busy, but busy bodies. Now we command and exhort such people by the Lord Jesus Christ to work quietly and to provide for themselves. Paul calls them out. <clears throat> he, he lays down this ultimatum. He, he calls them, he challenges them to provide for themselves, to work. And he starts by saying this, if anyone isn't willing to work, he should not eat. Uh, I want to very qu qu clearly focus on uh, a word there, willing. If anyone isn't willing to work. Paul's focus is not, is not on those who are unable to work. His focus is on those who are unwilling to work. Uh, the, the church needs to provide for those in need. He, they need to meet the needs of uh, widows and orphans and, and those who are vulnerable and those who are uh, oppressed. I mean, we need to, to, to have this compassion and care and concern. But Paul's saying if someone's able to work, <coughs> they just don't want to, that is a problem. And so if they're not willing to work, he should not eat. Um, I know for me, uh, I remember my dad saying this every once in a while. I don't think he ever got to the point where he wouldn't let me eat, uh, maybe for a few minutes and whatnot. But, but it, the, the reason that parents do this, the reason that Paul's doing this, is because it's demonstrating tough love. You're probably familiar with this concept of tough love. And so as we look at Paul's statements, how is Paul's tough stance an example of tough love. Or said another way, how is the consequence for not working both a rebuke and a motivator? What is Paul doing this? Why is Paul doing this? What is he try trying to accomplish? And if you think about it, he's rebuking them. He's telling them, you're wrong for not working, for being idle, for being lazy, for not living up to expectations. And so, so being able but unwilling to work is ungodly. It's unproductive and it's undisciplined. So Paul is calling them out for it. Uh, essentially, he's saying those who are able to self-support but refuse to do so, they burden the church. And so he's calling them out for it. Uh, but if you think about it, uh, I, I'm not sure if Paul had this in mind, but in Proverbs 16, verse 26, Proverbs 16, verse 26, it says, A worker's appetite works for him because his un hunger urges him on. <clears throat> so in Proverbs, we see that if someone is hungry, they're going to have more motivation to work. Um, and so very likely uh, and, and very clearly, Paul's desire was not uh, to just ignore them and cut them off and get rid of them. He's doing this tough love because it's important. It challenges them to, to work. It, it wakes them up to the reality of the need to be, uh, to be uh, working hard, not to be busy bodies, but to be busy working. And so um, we see Paul's desire for that. He goes on in verses 11 and 12. He talks a little bit more. He, he acknowledges that there were some who were idle. Um, so this word idle means both failing to perform one's expected duty, but also behaving contrary to good, beha good order. So it's just misbehaving and not doing what is expected, not working, uh, and, but also not fulfilling your, your, your expected activities. And so um, basically, they looked to be busy. He says they're not busy, right? The word busy there is indicating this idea of working. They're not, they're not being effective. They're not working. Um, they're not working like they should have been. been. <clears throat> Instead, they were busy bodies. And so Paul is having this play on words. He's depicting this idea that they, they think they're working, they, they act like they are, but in reality, um, they're being counterproductive. Uh, the word busybody kind of talks about this idea of working against others, antithetical to work. And so a busybody is, was someone and is someone who is meddling who's creating unnecessary problems along the way. Again, that's why Paul was so um, adamant about them avoiding, staying away from, keeping away from, not associating with these people. It's because not only uh, are these individuals uh, just not 
not producing, not working, not not desiring to to provide for themselves, but they're actually working against the desires and the purpose and the ministry of the church. They're becoming a drain and a, an anchor drawing them down. <clears throat> and so Paul, in verse uh, 12, he, uh, he again commands and exhorts. He's calling them out. He says to the people who are idle, by the Lord Jesus Christ. So again, pointing to Jesus and his authority and the need to be followers of Christ. He's saying, work quietly and provide for themselves. So verse Verse 13, verse 12, excuse me. It says, Now we command and exhort such people by the Lord Jesus Christ to work quietly and provide for themselves. You might have a different uh, word there. The word provide for themselves is uh, the literal translation in the Greek is eat your own bread or eat their own bread. Uh, And so uh, Paul was using an example of food. He was calling them not to eat. If they don't work, they don't eat. Uh, But really the concept is uh, is this. Paul was calling people to earn their own living. Bread is important. It's a, it's a, if you don't eat, you're not going to survive very long. And so he's essentially saying provide for yourself. He's calling them to work quietly and provide for themselves. Uh, one thing is important to understand is while the word quietly can literally mean in silence, um, Paul was probably more so referring to simply working without being disruptive. Uh, these busybodies were causing a commotion and 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 dragging down the the people around them. They're just becoming a hindrance. And so they needed to work quietly, work without being disruptive, provide for themselves. And so uh, as I was thinking about this, I kind of wanted to ask a question. Have you ever worked with someone who not only failed to get anything done, but in reality, they also distracted you from accomplishing your task as well? Have you ever been a part of that? Uh, my mind went to college and uh, the dreaded group project um, because it always seems like there was somebody in the per- one person in the group who did their best to distract everybody else. Uh, hopefully it wasn't you. Uh, I hope it wasn't me. I, some, I thought a little bit about that. Uh, but, but there's always somebody in the group. And so dealing with a college group that gets a little distracted is one thing. But dealing with disruption in the church is another another thing. It's a severe and an important thing. And that's why Paul was so adamant about it. And so we're going to see what Paul calls us uh, us to do. He called the the idle person to provide for themselves. But what about the followers, the believers in, in Christ, the ones who are working hard and diligent, who are following the example of Paul, Timothy, and Silas? What are they to do in handling someone who's not willing to work? <coughs> Excuse me. So look at verses 13 and following. <clears throat> 13 and following. But as for you, so he's transitioning back to the ones who are diligent, who are working hard. They are not idle. As for you, but as for you, brothers and sisters, do not grow weary in doing good. We're going to look at verse 14 and 15 in just a second. Uh, but do not grow weary in doing good. Paul wasn't specifically worried about their physical fatigue. I mean, yeah, it's important, but hard work is going to cause us to be tired. His focus was more at the loss of motivation or enthusiasm. Paul didn't want them to be discouraged from serving or doing what was right. And so why do you think Paul felt the need to say this to them? Why did Paul give them this this challenge in urging them not to grow weary, not to lose heart? And really what it boils down to is when there are only a few people, it's a few people doing the work, and not only just a few people doing the work, but a few people doing the work and others who are taking advantage of the work and just uh, not just benefiting from it, but, but taking resources away from the, the ultimate goal, the intended purpose, distracting. When that happens, they're probably going to get tired. They're going to get discouraged. Um, they're going to they're gonna look at the people who are taking advantage of the church's resources and generosity and say, man, why am I working so hard? Why am I giving so much effort? Um, why, it just seems like nothing's being done. This is a drag on the system. And, and it's a, a discouragement. 
<clears throat> so Paul understood the reality of what was going on, what was could happen if they didn't take care of the issue. And so first of all, he wanted to encourage them to continue to do good, to continue to work. And that's important for us. No matter what happens, we need to continue to pursue what is right, to work hard, to pursue the gospel, uh, to pursue the ministry of the church in, or, or in order for the gospel to be proclaimed. Um, and so that's what Paul starts off with. But look at verses 14 and 15. If anyone does not obey our instructions in this letter, take note of that person. Don't associate with him so that he may be ashamed. Yet don't consider him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. So verses 14 and 15, Paul goes on and he provides this conditional clause. Uh, it's, it's the, if this, don't do that. If someone does not do this, then you should do X, right? So it's a conditional statement. And in this Greek conditional statement, in the construction of it, Paul is saying, he's assuming the reality. He's expecting some, some of the idle people to ignore his commands. <clears throat> They're not going to listen to his exhortation. And so what Paul is saying is if they don't, if they do not obey the instructions in this letter, take note of that person. Write it down. Uh, pay attention. This idea of taking note really carries this idea of uh, uh, looking at a person's actions because their actions reflect their heart. And so Paul instructed the, the Thessalonians to pay attention to each other's behavior, to see what's going on. Because if they don't uh, follow the instructions, then they're, they're not uh, being willing to work. And so what do they do? Don't associate with them. The Greek word here means to mix up together or to mingle with. And so the word specifically is this idea of saying, basically here, um, don't, don't be near. Stay away from them. Um, those who are willing, who are willingly disobeying um, um, the Lord, you need to avoid them. And, and that's important for us to see and understand. But notice what he says there. His purpose is not just to judge them or to punish them. His purpose is so that they may be ashamed, so that they may be ashamed. And so the purpose of the shaming uh, was in order to convict, to call them to change their behavior. There's a passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 where Paul talks about this, about uh, godly grief. He says, for even if I grieved you with my letter, I don't regret it. He goes on in verse 10, it says, for godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, but worldly grief produces death. <clears throat> and so he considered, uh, he was thankful for the godly grief in their life because th look at what it has produced in you. This is the verse in 2 Corinthians 7. What a desire to clear yourselves. What indignation, what fear, what deep longing, what zeal, what justice. In every way you showed yourself to be pure in this matter. Uh, Paul's focus in 2 Thessalonians was to wake them up to the reality of the, the, the harm they were causing to the church and the need to work diligently, uh, to be obedient to Christ's commands, to, to work hard. And so um, Paul's purpose is to... Um, to call them back, to call them out in love. And so notice what he says here in verse 15, don't consider him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. Real quick on the enemy, I, I wanna say that it's important to remember how believers are supposed to treat their enemies. Jesus said in Matthew 5, <clears throat> um, 43 and following, it says, you have heard it said, love your neighbor, hate your enemy, but I tell you, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. And he goes on and talks about it. And so, um, so when Paul says, don't treat them as an enemy, even if they were our enemy, we're supposed to love them. But what Paul is saying is they're not your enemy who you show, should love. He's your family. He's your brother. He's your sister in Christ who you need to call out. Uh, but warn him. This idea of warning is very much um, a, a wake-up call. He's saying warn them as a brother because your desire is for them to return back to the faith, to do what is right. <clears throat> and so as we are finishing up, we got, I got a couple questions and then I'm going to give some application. Um, but here's a couple questions for us to think about. Have you ever been called out for doing something that's wrong? And I'm sure you have. Uh, maybe something popped in your mind or you ha haven't been called out in a while. I hope that's the case. Uh, but have you ever been called out for doing something that's wrong? Here's the question after that. Was it a good experience or was it a bad one? I'm sure it wasn't fun. 
but was it a good experience or it is bad? Because, I mean, thinking about this, you know, being corrected isn't fun, but depending on how that person is doing it, depending on the person who's doing it, that correction can lead to growth and instruction and reconciliation in the end. Uh, it can help you know, hey, I was doing something wrong. I didn't, I didn't know, but now I know. And so it can be beneficial. So when you know the person loves you and cares for you, it makes their correction just a little bit easier. And, and, and actually, when I say just a little bit easier, it's like, okay, it's not fun, but I know they care for me. And so you can grow through it. But if a person is doing it out of uh, arrogance or doing it out of uh, judgmental, being judgmental and like, uh, how dare you, holier than thou mentality, it can lead to the opposite, draw you away. Um, and so, yes, we still need to listen to truth, but it does matter how people do it. So in 1 Timothy chapter 1, 1 Timothy chapter 1, right, right across uh, the next page, essentially, from what we've been studying just now, Paul goes through and he talks about his testimony. He says, I give thanks to Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, appointing me to the ministry, even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an arrogant man. But I received mercy because I acted out of ignorance and unbelief. And the grace of our Lord f overflowed along with the faith and the love that are in Christ Jesus. This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Christ came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them. <clears throat> Paul's testimony, his own testimony, is about how he received God's grace. And so when you think about this, that's Paul's testimony and right now he's calling out those who are idle, who are in the church and who are not doing what's expected. And so his desire is not to shame to the point of judgmental and just ignore them and they're now our enemies. He's, his desire is to say, hey, I was convicted of my sins. We as believers are here to help each other, to hold each other accountable. And so Paul clearly understood the purpose uh, or the reality of grace and mercy that he received from the Lord. And so he viewed himself as the worst sinner, yet Christ saved him. So his desire is reconciliation. All throughout his letters we see that. And that's important for us as well. Uh, what is the golden rule? When you think of the golden rule, it's do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. I think that's very important when it comes to church discipline because how would you want others to treat your sin of idleness? How would you want others to correct you? And it's clearly going to be with love and mercy. It's clearly going to be with a desire of reconciliation, not with a desire of removal. Uh, and so um, Paul, he's demonstrating this, and we can understand it because we need to treat each other with love and respect. And so as, I, as we come to the application, I, I typically don't like to add new information. <clears throat> Meaning, I don't. I don't want to look at new verses. I don't want to. I don't want to dive into new material. But I think as we do this, it's important for us to read Matthew chapter seven, verses one through five. Matthew seven, verses one through five, because uh, I think it's going to help us as we apply this passage. It says, "Do not judge, so that you will not be judged, for you will be judged by the same standard with which you judge others, and you will be ma measured by the same measure you use." Why do you look at the splinter in your brother's eye, but don't notice the beam of wood in your own eye? Or how can you say to me, just to your brother, let me take the splinter out of your eye, and look, there's a beam of wood in your own eye. Hypocrite, first take the beam of wood out of your eye, and then you will see clearly to take the splinter out of your brother's eye. And so the reason I read this is, you know, Paul didn't specifically talk about it, but it should inform us in how we deal with others. We don't need to be hypocritical. We need to examine ourselves. We need to be humble. And so here's three questions I'm going to ask myself, and I'm going to encourage you to do the same um, before we, uh, as we apply this passage from 2 Thessalonians. And the questions are this. Am I living according to the traditions I have received? Am I, am I following God's word? And uh, that's, that's hard. We need to evaluate it. Um, Matt, uh, James talks about looking into the law of God. So looking intently into the word of God and as a mirror. Right? So we need to evaluate our own lives by God's word. Am I doing that? Am I working hard or am I hardly working? Am I guilty of being idle? Am I living and, and pursuing what is right? And then finally, am I treating other believers as enemies or as brothers or sisters in Christ? Because that is very important for us to understand. How we bring about God's conviction 
It's through God's Word. It's through the Holy Spirit and other believers. We are to hold each other accountable. We need to do it with humility. So when we do this, when we apply the passage of Matthew 7, 1 through 5, <clears throat> when we take the beam out of our own eye, not only will we be able to see clearly, but we will also have the humility necessary to speak the truth in love. And Paul, he experienced that forgiveness. He experienced that conviction. And he experienced God's grace. And when he did that, he saw how he should treat others as brothers, not as enemies. And so I'm going to pray for us, and we'll be dismissed. Thank you for tuning in and uh, all throughout this quarter, this semester, uh, not semester, sorry, this quarter uh, of our literature. Uh, we're diving into First and Second Kings next week. Dear God, thank you for this passage, for this challenge, uh, for the encouragement and the, the significance of uh, church discipline, of, of holding each other accountable. God, I pray that if, um, if I am lacking in any way that someone would call me out in love, pointing me back to God's Word. God, I pray that we would do the same, uh, that we work hard, we follow the example of Paul, Timothy, Silas, other believers in our life who are working hard, and that we will avoid the temptation of being idle or lazy, but we will work hard desiring to do the ministry of the church. Thank you for who you are and what you're doing in our lives. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.